Esteemed scholars and knowledge seekers are welcome once more to the hallowed chamber of the Inquisition's library. Here in the shadows, we uncover the most haunting events that have shaped our Imperium's grim history. Today marks the second lecture in our series on the Horus Heresy, a momentous chapter that forever stained the tapestry of humanity. The very name, Horus Heresy, sends shivers down our spines, a reminder of a time when loyalty crumbled and brotherhood turned to betrayal. In our previous lecture, we planted the seeds of this darkness, tracing its origins to the corrupted whispers that crept into the hearts of the mighty Primarchs, those godlike leaders of our revered Space Marine Legions, the Legionis Astartes. We glimpsed the War Master Horus, once a paragon of loyalty, succumbing to the sinister clutches of hostility that sought to devour his soul. And now, my dear listeners, we plunge deeper into this abyss, uncovering the horrors that lurked beneath the surface of brotherhood and unity. So I urge you to sit, gather your courage, and prepare yourselves for the chilling tales that lie ahead. Within these dark passages, we shall confront the heresy's true nature and look at Horus's opening betrayal on the planet of Istvan III. Picture, my friends, a distant world named Istvan III, once basking in the warm embrace of Imperial compliance a testament to the relentless efforts of Primarch Korax and his loyal Raven Guard Legion. For 15 long years, Istvan III had thrived under the Emperor's dominion, its people embracing the teachings of the Imperial Truth with unwavering devotion, standing tall as fierce defenders of humanity. Any remnants of resistance were ruthlessly crushed, and Istvan III became a shining beacon of Imperial unity. But betrayal and heresy had taken root beneath the surface of this apparent harmony, like a serpent coiled in darkness. A sinister seed had sprouted in Governor Vardas Pral's heart, entrusted with upholding the Emperor's vision. Driven by misguided zeal, Pral unleashed a wave of destruction upon the ancient religious sites, seeking to obliterate any lingering superstitions among the Istvanians. As fate would have it, the warp storms descended upon Istvan III, cutting off all communication with the wider Imperium. For six long Terran years, the truth of Pral's malevolence remained shrouded in silence, but the truth has a way of clawing its way to the surface, and a faint astropathic transmission eventually reached the ears of the Council of Terror, an echo that carried the horrors of rebellion. In a twisted irony, the people once uplifted by the Emperor's light had risen in rebellion, spurred on by religious fervor and led by Governor Vardas Pral. The proud streets of Krivanak now ran crimson with the blood of those branded as non-believers. Such betrayal, a dark blemish on the Great Crusade, could not go unanswered. The Imperium, under the guidance of the Imperial War Master Horus, couldn't turn a blind eye to this vile sedition. Thus, Horus, the mighty Imperial War Master, took it upon himself to pass judgment upon the people of Istvan III. In his eyes, it was a chance to demonstrate the dire consequences of betrayal, to make an example of this world. But unbeknownst to many, this act of retribution was a carefully calculated opportunity for Horus to enact his sinister plan. This plan would plunge the loyal Space Marine Legions into a nightmarish abyss of chaos and destruction. In the twisted mind of Horus, the events on Istvan III presented an opportunity too alluring to ignore, the perfect canvas upon which to unleash his malevolence. With the cunning of a master puppeteer, he maneuvered his forces, bringing the unsuspecting legions to their doom while consolidating the loyalists around him. The tumultuous waters of the Ultima Segmentum, masked by the raging warp storms, acted as the cloak of darkness for Horus's sinister plan. Summoning the Death Guard, Emperor's children, World Eaters, and his own sons of Horus, he drew them to the Istvan system, their actions hidden from the prying eyes of the galaxy. As War Master, Horus played a deadly game of regicide, manipulating the pieces on the Imperial chessboard to his advantage. Cunningly, he dispatched Primarchs Lionel Johnson, Sanguinius, and Robute Gilliman to far-flung regions of space on perilous missions, keeping them out of the impending tragedy. Meanwhile, the Night Lords, Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors, Raven Guard, Salamanders, and Iron Hands were embroiled in their conflicts, blissfully ignorant of the impending darkness. Even the Word Bearers, Masters of Deception, kept their allegiance hidden, only revealing their hand at the opportune moment. The White Scars and Imperial Fists, guarding the Segmentum Solar and standing close to the Emperor, were beyond Horus's reach, 
without arousing suspicion. The Space Wolves and Thousand Sons, caught in the tragic burning of Prospero, were ensnared in a web of violence long before this hour of reckoning. All the while, a massive war fleet gathered on the fringes of the Istvan system, heralding the beginning of a ruthless campaign. Rebel outposts were crushed as a prelude to the impending cataclysm. Amidst this maelstrom, on Istvan Extremis, the elite First Company of the Emperor's Children Legion, led by the insidious Lord Commander Eidolon, joined forces with Nathaniel Garrow's Death Guard Seventh Company. As they faced the horrors of battle, Garrow's encounter with a formidable Slaneshi Psyker left him near death. But salvation came from Chief Apothecary Fabius, who intervened with dark expertise. Yet even in their victory, Eidolon's chilling ability, a haunting shriek born of a modified tracheal implant, spoke volumes of the corruption that had taken root within the Emperor's Children Legion. The stage was set, the curtain drawn, but the true horror of Istvan III had only just begun. The darkness within Horus's heart had grown vast and insatiable, and the galaxy trembled as it awaited the devastating climax of this treacherous act. This climax would forever alter the fate of humanity and plunge the Imperium into an abyss of unending terror. The assault on Istvan III was a cataclysmic symphony of destruction, orchestrated by evil forces with cold precision. As the skies wept iron and drop pods descended like celestial hammers, the Coral City trembled under the unyielding might of the Space Marine Legions. The defenders, once loyal to the Imperium, had been twisted and corrupted, their fervor now devoted to the dark whispers of Slaanesh. The Death Guard, led by the grim Primarch Mortarion, advanced relentlessly, their footsteps pounding against the western fortifications. Entrenched and fortified, the traitorous troops posed a formidable challenge, but the Death Guard pressed forward with unyielding resolve. Artillery fire erupted like volcanic eruptions as basilisks and Malkador tanks revealed their treacherous faces. Yet the Death Guard navigated through the storm deftly, closing in on their enemy within their own firing zone. The Istvanian artillery caught off guard, fired blindly, their shells bursting around the Death Guard, but their advance remained undeterred. Terminators and heavy support squads wreaked havoc upon gun towers and bunkers, while tactical squads methodically cleared trenches with bolter fire. Gunships descended from the heavens, unloading Vindicator and Land Raider tanks, laying waste to bastions and towering walls that dared to shield the city. Meanwhile, the World Eaters, a force of brutal savagery, struck the siren hold with a ferocity unparalleled. Their drop pods obliterated open plazas, transforming them into shattered wastelands of death. As they charged forth, they left a trail of destruction, tearing through the disordered garrison troops with relentless violence. The Istvanian war singers emerged from the shadows, wielding strange relic technology, unleashing sonic assaults that ruptured armor and flesh alike. Their eerie cries goaded the fanatical defenders to throw themselves recklessly into the fray, fueling the battlefield's madness. Amidst the chaos, an unnatural symphony of agony filled the air. An orchestra of screams, battle cries, bolter shots, and the menacing growl of chain blades. This horrifying melody tore at the people's minds, inciting uncontrollable hatred. Yet shielded by their indomitable will and advanced armor, the Space Marines resisted the insidious assault, fighting on amidst the nightmarish chorus. The Death Guard and the Legio Mortis reduced fortifications to rubble and cleared the labyrinthine tunnels beneath. The World Eaters, swarmed by waves of desperate civilians, fought back with an overwhelming force, pushing back the hordes through sheer numbers. In the heart of the Siren Hold and the Precentor's Palace, victory was won through bloodshed and sacrifice. The war singers fell, silenced by the Sons of Horus, while Captain Lucius and his Emperor's children confronted the traitorous Vardas Prahl in his twisted throne room. The battle was fierce. Prowl fighting desperately with his psychosonic weaponry, but Lucius's skillful blade ultimately spelt his doom. With Prowl's fall, the city descended into chaos, the rebellion crumbling beneath the might of the Space Marines. Thousands of rebels lay dead, their resistance shattered, and the victorious warriors celebrated their conquest. Yet, little did they know that a greater horror awaited them, a betrayal of unimaginable proportions lurking in the shadows. Ready to cast its dark pall upon the galaxy, the treacherous storm of the Horus heresy was about to break.
The fires had abated, leaving a desolate landscape in its wake. But a revelation ignited a consuming fury within the heart of the Warmaster Horus. Contrary to his sinister expectations, nearly 100,000 loyalist Astartes from the Sons of Horus, Emperor's Children, Death Guard, and World Eater's Legions had survived the brutal bombardment. Against all odds, these brave warriors had secured the Coral City with minimal losses and clung to life amidst the wreckage. Through urgent messages relayed from their loyal brethren in orbit, they sought refuge in hastily resealed bunkers, fortified bastions, and the enigmatic catacombs beneath the Siren Hold. Trusting in their training, battle-worn equipment, and the unwavering resilience bestowed upon them by the Emperor's grand design, they endured. The shattered communication channels crackled with renewed life as the rainstorms washed away the ashen aftermath. Frantic signals pulsated across the scarred surface of Istvan III, demanding answers, screaming defiance, and unleashing curses at those they had once called brothers. Never before had such a despicable act of treachery and malice been witnessed within the annals of the Space Marine Legions. The Astartes on Istvan III were consumed by unbridled wrath, some teetering on the precipice of madness as their very Primarchs had turned against them. Their determination blazed like a furnace in the face of this unimaginable betrayal. United in their loyalty to the Emperor and fueled by an unyielding sense of duty, they vowed to carry on. The name Sons of Horus held no meaning for them anymore, replaced by a new identity, the Lunar Wolves, soldiers of the Emperor. With resolute hearts, they embraced the daunting task ahead, prepared to confront their treacherous brethren and, if need be, to lay down their lives in the name of the Emperor. As the stars above witnessed their newfound resolve, the galaxy braced for a cataclysmic confrontation between brothers turned foes. In the aftermath of the viral bombardment, madness took hold of Istvan III. Despite Horus's futile attempts to regain control and order a second orbital assault, Primarch Angron took matters into his blood-stained hands. Leading a relentless wave of gunships and drop pods, the World Eaters made a brutal planetfall, accompanied by his chosen warriors, with Angron himself at the forefront. The Warmaster and his allies could only watch in outrage as the Primarch of the World Eaters unleashed his bloodthirsty space marines, seeking their loyalist brethren with murderous intent. Their thundering gunships strafed the ash-covered ruins and met with sporadic resistance from their intended targets. With a deafening roar, the Red Angel emerged from his gunship onto the desolate plazas, where the bones of the fallen lay scattered like winter leaves. His mighty chain axes, Gorefather and Gorechild, thirsted for the slaughter ahead. The broken cityscape erupted with weapons fire aimed at this formidable Primarch, but he advanced undeterred, embodying a nightmarish creature brought to life. Behind him, the World Eaters formed an arrowhead formation, clad in pale ceramite and gleaming metal, eager to spill blood. The Butcher's Nails, forbidden implants that fueled their rage, screamed for violence with an insatiable force. Their loyalist brothers appeared from the shattered ruins that lined the plazas, no less fervent in their fury. They too were world eaters, consumed by an unparalleled rage heightened by the bitterness of betrayal. Brother Captain Erlen led this force, accompanied by 2,000 loyal space marines who had sought shelter in nearby garrison bunkers, awaiting the storm they were falsely led to believe would come from an Istvanian bioweapon. The truth, when revealed, was almost too unbearable to comprehend. Now, faced with two and a half times their number, their former battle brothers and the very Primarch to whom they had pledged their lives, they were overwhelmed by an uncontrollable madness. Determined to take as many traitors down as possible, they embraced a homicidal frenzy, clawing and cutting to extinguish the lives of those they once called brethren. In this harrowing clash of brother against brother, the true horror of betrayal unfolded on the blood-soaked grounds of Istvan III. The sky seemed to burn, stars falling from the inferno as if guided by avenging angels. Armored and clad for slaughter, these fallen angels descended upon the ravaged realm they had destroyed, led by one greater than them all, their maker, Angron. Amidst the ashes, those who remained gazed upon the sky, knowing that death had come upon them. Amid this chilling spectacle, the echoes of the Emperor's words resonated like haunting whispers, echoes of trust shattered and brotherhood sundered. The world became a canvas painted in blood and fire, 
its essence consumed by the darkness of treachery and betrayal. The horror of war, the nightmarish descent into madness, unfolded before their eyes as the tragic symphony of Istvan III played on. In the wake of the relentless thunderstorms that had engulfed Istvan III, the traitors renewed their assault with reinforcements and fresh munitions. The ferocity of the attack had taken a heavy toll on both sides, with loyalist and traitor blood mingling on the ashen soil. The defenders fought valiantly, but the traitors pressed on, relentlessly encircling the remaining loyalists, closing in on them like a noose tightening their necks. Among the traitor forces, however, a surprising and ominous rebellion simmered within the ranks of the Death Guard. In a battle known as the Vale of Grief, chaos erupted as friend and foe became indistinguishable in the haze of war. The Death Guard, torn between their loyalties, found themselves firing upon their own and at times turning their weapons against their traitorous brethren. Marshal Durak Rask and his loyal crew refused to obey orders to fire upon the loyalists, leading to a gruesome end at the hands of Chrysos Morturg and his destroyer squad. Even the formidable Death Guard Primarch, Mortarion, bore the marks of betrayal when struck by plasma fire from his own legion's predator tank, before retaliating with a brutal vengeance. The battlefield became a hellish tableau of fratricidal madness. As the storm subsided and the traitors regrouped, fresh troops and heavy armor landed on the outskirts of the Coral City. Mortarion's Death Guard bore down on the remaining Loyalist stronghold with unyielding determination. The once proud Loyalists, clinging to their last shreds of hope, stood their ground but were outnumbered and outgunned. Salvaged tanks and captured armor could only delay the inevitable onslaught of the traitor forces, bolstered by Fellblade Super Heavy tanks and the terrifying Legio Mortis Titans. The brutal battle raged on, each side desperately struggling for survival. The Loyalists fought fiercely, but the traitors, driven by their newfound allegiance to Horus, pushed forward relentlessly. Tactical squads advanced in disciplined formations, their bolters unleashing a symphony of death. The Loyalists fought back, manning captured artillery and firing until their ammunition ran dry. But the weight of the traitor forces bore down upon them, overwhelming their defenses and forcing the survivors to retreat into the city's bowels. The darkness played host to an even more sinister confrontation in the depths of subsurface tunnels. Mortarion pursued the remaining Loyalist Death Guard, determined to crush the last vestiges of resistance. The clash of Primarchs, once brothers, now divided by betrayal, carried an air of dread and despair. Above ground, the battle continued unabated. Sons of Horus Terminators, led by First Captain Abaddon, methodically crushed any remnants of Loyalist resistance, supported by the thunderous might of Titans and twisted war machines from the dark realms of the Dark Mechanicus. Heretics wielding malevolent weapons and the eerie presence of witch priests from Davin's Serpent Lodge added to the nightmarish spectacle. The scales of slaughter had tipped decisively in Horus's favor, leaving the Loyalist defenders on the brink of oblivion. The once unbreakable bonds of brotherhood shattered, replaced by the harrowing reality of betrayal and the relentless pursuit of vengeance. In the heart of this nightmare, the true horror of war unfolded as the forces of darkness engulfed Istvan III in an unrelenting storm of bloodshed and despair. As the Loyalists hunkered down in the city's ruins, their hearts heavy with grim determination, the traitors closed in like a pack of relentless predators. With their newfound advantage, the traitorous forces descended upon the Precentor's palace, hungry for victory. Above, the darkened skies echoed with the deafening roar of Avenger strike fighters and Thunderhawk gunships, spewing a torrent of explosives and cannon fire upon suspected Loyalist positions, leaving no avenue of escape. The Death Guard, World Eaters and Sons of Horus Legions surged through the battered city in an ominous crescent formation. Rhinos, Land Raiders and Predator tanks paved the way, their engines growling with menace. Jetbike Skyhunter squadrons and land speeders scoured the skies, eyes sharp for hidden threats, while towering titans of the Legio Mortis and Legio Ordax loomed over the landscape like colossal behemoths. The DZ Rai, a titan among titans, marched forward. Its every footfall, a quake of devastation that shattered the already fractured cityscape. The air reverberated with the war cries of the traitor space marines, a chilling sound that sent shivers down the spines of those who dared to defy them. 
In the face of such overwhelming firepower, the Loyalists were trapped, like prey cornered by a vicious pack of wolves. Any attempt at resistance was swiftly met with the full fury of the Titans' devastating weaponry, obliterating entire city blocks and reducing structures to smoking rubble. The brilliant flashes of destruction illuminated the night, visible even from the cold depths of space, a haunting testament to the raw power of the traitor forces. As the city crumbled around them, the Loyalists braced for the storm of violence that was about to engulf them. Their fate hung in the balance, and the city seemed to tremble in fear as the traitors closed in, their eyes ablaze with vengeance and the promise of victory. Amid this dark and unforgiving battleground, the true horrors of war unfurled their wings, enveloping Istvan III in an inescapable nightmare of bloodshed and despair. Amidst the crumbling ruins and the looming shadows of devastation, Captain Loken and his Lunar Wolves steeled themselves for the final desperate stand against their treacherous brethren, the Sons of Horus. Ezekiel Abaddon led the relentless assault on the Siren Hold, a cold fury burning in his eyes as he sought to eradicate any lingering Loyalist resistance. The traitors descended upon their former comrades from all directions, their assault rams crashing into the upper levels like monstrous beasts. In contrast, Assault squads descended from gunship troop bays, hungry for bloodshed. Tanks rumbled through the debris, and despoiler squads thirsted for the taste of Loyalist flesh. The Lunar Wolves fought back with the ferocity of desperation, but the odds were stacked against them, and hope was dwindling as rapidly as their ammunition. In the face of certain doom, some Loyalists sought to escape, understanding that survival was a victory against the overwhelming tide. Others, injured and cut off, stood their ground, willing to sacrifice for the cause they held dear. With their backs against the wall, they fired their weapons until they were dry, their courage unyielding. Yet, the traitor Justerian Terminators breached the Loyalist barricades, an unstoppable force of death and destruction. The Siren Hold fell, but not without a fierce and bitter fight. Many Loyalists escaped, finding refuge in the depths below the ruins. Little did they know, the hunt for survival was only just beginning. First, Captain Abaddon, his heart consumed by the bitterness of victory, ordered his forces to scour the city, sparing no dark weapon or wicked ally in their pursuit. Phosphex canisters were unleashed into the air vents and catacombs, turning the underground passages into hellish death traps. The dark sorcery of the Davenite witches and chaos cultists added to the malevolent aura as they hunted down every last loyalist survivor. Within the eerie glow of search lamps, Abaddon and Horus Aximand crossed paths with Captains Loken and Torgaddon in a burned-out building. It was a tragic meeting, a grim dance of fate, as Torgaddon fell in single combat against the traitor, Little Horus. And Loken fought with every ounce of his strength until he was left mortally wounded, helpless, and facing the impending orbital bombardment of the planet, Loken's fate seemed sealed. As the darkness descended over the city, Search lamps prowled the ruins like hungry beasts, casting unsettling beams of light that danced upon skeletal remains. The once proud capital had become a haunted wasteland where the titans moved like behemoths from the depths of nightmares. Sporadic gunfire echoed through the city, a chilling reminder of the relentless manhunt underway. In the cold silence, Istvan III embraced its final throes, transitioning from a mere battle to a merciless, vengeful hunt as the traitors hunted down and extinguished the last flickers of resistance. The planet had become a tomb, its walls adorned with the memory of a valiant but doomed stand, where the cries of betrayal and the echo of fallen heroes haunted the air like whispers from the beyond. The echoes of Warmaster Horus's betrayal in the Istvan system reverberated through the ages, an unfathomable act of treachery that forever stained our history. Istvan III, once a thriving world, now transformed into a desolate wasteland, consumed by the horrors of plague and fire. The traitors had unleashed the monstrous Life Eater virus. With a vengeful god's fury, they ravaged the planet with firestorms, reducing it to a smoldering graveyard. Their aim was clear, swiftly eliminating the Loyalists, keeping their treachery concealed, and gaining the upper hand, preparing for further strikes against the Imperium. However, their meticulously laid plans were not without cracks. The Loyalists, against insurmountable odds, fought with a tenacity born of unwavering loyalty to the Emperor.
They stood firm in the face of overwhelming might, knowing the peril they faced. On Istvan III, every passing day meant an increased risk of discovery for the traitors, and every battle depleted their resources, hindering their ability to strike further against the Emperor. Though the Loyalists ultimately perished, their sacrifice was not in vain. As Space Marines and devoted warriors of the Emperor, they exacted a heavy toll on the traitors, dealing a severe blow to Horus's rebellion. The blade of civil war had been unsheathed, and with it came the unquenchable thirst for vengeance among those fiercely loyal to the Imperium. There was no room for mercy or compromise, only war, unyielding and brutal. Captain Saul Tarvitz, discovering Horus's treacherous plans, fearlessly descended to the doomed planet, risking his life to warn his fellow Loyalists. In an act of courage and defiance, he saved two-thirds of the Loyalist Space Marines, turning what was meant to be a massacre into a successful guerrilla war and throwing a wrench into Horus's meticulous schemes. Tarvitz's actions played a vital role in the survival of the Loyalists, weathering the virus bombing and coordinating a cohesive defense against the traitors. His contributions shaped the course of the wider war. He paid the ultimate price for his bravery, apparently meeting his end on Istvan III, but his memory would forever be etched in the hearts of those he saved. Captain Garviel Loken, a symbol of loyalty and honor, refused to let Horus's betrayal consume him. Despite the horrors he witnessed, he survived the virus bombing and firestorm, emerging from the chaos as a beacon of hope and defiance. Loken assumed a leadership role among the surviving Astartes under his command, and they shed the name Sons of Horus, reclaiming their original identity as Lunar Wolves. In the carnage, they inflicted heavy casualties upon their former comrades, reminding the traitors that their brotherhood was not so quickly shattered. Miraculously, Loken himself survived his grievous wounds, standing witness to the final orbital bombardment of the Coral City. The War Master, perhaps out of a twisted sense of mercy, or simply to remove any trace of defiance, resorted to high explosives, delivering a chilling conclusion to the Battle of Istvan III, leaving no doubt about the victor. But the legacy of the Loyalists endured, burning bright like a solitary flame in the cold darkness of betrayal and war. In the midst of unraveling chaos and crumbling worlds, Battle Captain Garrow found himself entwined in a web of treachery that demanded a desperate escape and a truth to be told. His vessel, the Eisenstein, floated like a paper ship in a tempest, surrounded by Horus's vessels that held dominion over the stars. The odds were grim, and the frigate's engines were naught but a desperate whisper against the roaring gales of betrayal. But Garrow, no stranger to the dance of fate, concocted a plan. With the guile of a master conjurer, they fabricated a fault in the ship's core, a cunning lie to mask their intentions. They slipped from the forefront of the chaos, dipping into the shadows to evade the hungry gaze of Horus. Yet like a raven with eyes that saw beyond, Death Guard's first captain, Callus Typhon, sensed deceit in the air. The pursuit was relentless, the chase a heartbeat echoing in the void. The Eisenstein, battered and weary, became a wounded creature, fleeing from the jaws of a relentless predator. The ship's heart was laid bare, communication lines severed, navigation systems crippled, a wounded gazelle among wolves. But desperation can turn even the faintest spark into an inferno. Battle Captain Garrow, a beacon of tenacity, seized his crew's fate and forged it into a blade of defiance. He commanded a leap into the warp's moor, a blind leap into the swirling abyss that only the daring dare to dance with. The traitor fleet, jaws agape, watched as the frigate vanished, a wraith slipping through their fingers. The Eisenstein emerged from the smoldering remains of Istvan III, battered but free. The universe held its breath, uncertain of its fate. A single ship, an underdog stand, became the fulcrum of change. Garrow's choice struck a discordant note in a cosmos where chaos was the symphony, shifting the tempo against the traitors and escaping to warn the loyalists of the Imperium of the betrayal and changing the outcome of the heresy forever. I hope today's lecture on the tragic events of the Istvan III atrocity has shed light on a dark chapter of our history. As Imperial librarians, it is our solemn duty to preserve the knowledge of these past horrors so that future generations may learn from the mistakes of the past. The horrors of Istvan III serve as a stark reminder of the dangers of betrayal and the insidious influence of chaos. 
It is a testament to the strength of our Imperium that we have endured such trials and emerged stronger. United in our loyalty to the Emperor and our determination to defend humanity from all threats. Let us never forget the sacrifices of those who fell on Istvan III and the countless others who have given their lives in service to the Imperium. Through their memory, we find the resolve to uphold the values of the Imperium and to stand against the forces of darkness. May the knowledge we have shared today guide us in our pursuit of truth and wisdom, and may we continue to safeguard the legacy of the Imperium for generations to come. Thank you all for your attentive presence, and may the Emperor's light shine upon us always. Ave Imperator.